The Israeli military says at least 10 Israeli soldiers have been killed in heavy fighting in Gaza City. The IDF now calling it one of its deadliest single-day death counts since their ground invasion began. I'm Ellison Barber in for Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. The resistance being shown by Hamas might just highlight how far Israel is from its goal of completely destroying them. Perhaps this is why today Israel's defense minister said the war will carry on for, quote, more than several months, despite U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan telling Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that he wants Israel to scale down its war against Hamas, though Sullivan did not specify a timetable for that. The comments come more than two months into Israel's military campaign in the Gaza Strip where the death toll is rapidly increasing. So far, over 18,700 people have been killed, according to the health ministry in Gaza. A majority of them, they say, women and children. Today, the UN sounded the alarm on the growing food crisis. Half of the population uh, are starving. Uh, the, uh, the grim reality is also that nine out of ten people uh, uh, are not eating enough, are not eating every day, and don't know uh, where the next meal is going to come from. Scores of injured people arrived at the Nasser Hospital in Han Yunus today after airstrikes fell on the area. People there say the bombs do not discriminate. They're hitting children and even ambulances. تم استهداف من بداية العدوان على غزة أكثر من 17 سيارة إسعاف مباشر واستشهاد أربعة من زملاتنا وأربعة من زملاتنا الكادر واثنين من المتطوعين no one seems to know when this war will end or what will happen when it does. This week, a senior Israeli diplomat made it clear that it will not accept a two-state solution, which begs the question, what will it accept? NBC News senior Washington correspondent and host of Hallie Jackson Now, Hallie Jackson, joins us from Haifa, Israel. Hallie, White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was in Tel Aviv today. We know there's been a slight shifting in terms of the messages of support coming from President Biden and the administration. Uh, did Jake Sullivan uphold or reiterate that message today? We're learning more tonight, Ellison, and it's going to be with you, about the message that Jake Sullivan delivered. And here's the thing, right? The, the support for Israel, broadly speaking, is being reiterated even by President Biden, even as he says things, as he did today, like he, he would like Israel to be more careful. He is still, and his administration is still making clear that they back Israel's fight against Hamas here. And Jake Sullivan, according to the White House, reiterated that message today. But there's a couple of other things that came up that I think show some of this daylight here of where the U.S. would like Israel to be and where Israel actually is. And I think the primary thing among that is the timeline. You, you are seeing now questions, and NBC News has some new reporting now from multiple sources familiar with the discussions, that the Biden administration would like the Israelis to begin to shift soon to a different phase of this war, to the less... Um, uh, to a less intense and more precise tactical operation in this war, rather than the bombing of Gaza that we've seen so far, which President Biden himself just earlier this week called indiscriminate bombing. So that is something that appeared to have come up in the conversations that the NSA, the National Security Advisor, had with Prime Minister Netanyahu and others here in Israel, according to the White House. Of course, they couch it in, in language to say, you know, the discussion of uh, some kind of shift here. Uh, there's not there's not been a specific date on that, of course. And the Israeli defense minister has said that the expectation is that this war should last for several more months. So you see some of the daylight there. Other key topics discussed, you will not be surprised to hear, Ellison, the push to get more hostages released, the question of when could negotiations happen again. And then, of course, that broader discussion is we're here in Haifa, which, as you know, is in, is in the further north of Tel Aviv in Israel, the discussion of how to avoid a broader regional conflict here with this war between Israel and Hamas in the south of Israel and Gaza. How do you prevent this from escalating and becoming bigger with Hezbollah and Lebanon to the north, other Iran-backed uh, Iran proxies elsewhere? Um, and then, of course, we've seen uh, an uptick in some of the violence in the West Bank after a 60-hour IDF operation there, Ellison. You know, Hallie, it's interesting because I look at polling that's coming out of Israel of Israeli citizens, Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs, and the majority of the 
Israeli public, they support very strongly what Israel is doing inside of Gaza. I mean, do you get the sense that Netanyahu would defer to the United States or that Israel is willing to bend, I guess, in some ways to appease such an important ally or because he does have such strong support for it amongst his own people that they'll listen, but nothing will really change? Yeah, I mean, listen, there's a lot of nuance here, too, because I think there are others who will tell you that Netanyahu, politically broadly speaking, is coming from a slightly more weak position after what happened on October 7th. And even before that, you saw the judicial reform protests in this country. The Israelis have largely deferred questions about the massive intelligence failure that appears to have led to that Hamas attack, or at least uh, the, the shock and surprise of that Hamas attack. And they continue to say, we'll, we'll talk about that after the war. We'll talk about that after the war. I had a conversation with one of the ministers here in Israel just recently who said the same thing. But at some point, there will be a reckoning over that. And it is not at all clear uh, how the prime minister will come through that reckoning, if you will, Ellison. As far as Israel's determination to continue this war, it is resolute. They have said again and again that their mission is to destroy Hamas. The diplomacy behind the scenes is always part of the conversation here with the U.S., talking with Israeli counterparts, etc. And that's why there's a lot of interest, I think, in Sullivan's appearance here. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, he is also set, we're just learning tonight, he is set to go visit the West Bank tomorrow to be in Ramallah to talk with the head of the Palestinian Authority, which is another piece to this puzzle as well. What happens after this war ends? There is a lot of daylight between the U.S. and Israel on that, as far as whether there can be a Palestinian state, as the U.S. insists there has to be, to have a lasting peace, versus the Israelis, uh, with some top leaders here suggesting that that is just off the table at this point, Ellison. All right. Hallie Jackson, thank you so much. Israel says roughly 116 soldiers have died in combat in this conflict so far. Hundreds of others have been injured. Our team was given access inside a Tel Aviv hospital where one doctor says the casualties keep coming. NBC News correspondent Hala Garani has more. Inside the Ikhilov Hospital in Tel Aviv since October 7th, an entire floor is now dedicated to the rehab of wounded Israeli soldiers. It was an open fracture and my tibia bone here completely shattered. Our access granted by the Israeli military brought us to a soldier named Yuval, who also spoke with Lester back in October after the initial Hamas attacks. He is still recovering and remains determined to fight. Every soldier here in the hospitals, Everybody want to get the quickest recovery they can, so to be back on the battlefield. Every day here, choppers bring in Israeli soldiers wounded in the combat in Gaza. Dr. Eyal Hashavia says he needs to work fast. The casualties keep coming. Ever since uh, October 7th, we've been getting more than 500 uh, soldiers, injured soldiers. We're getting injured, severely injured patients by the missiles. Beyond the fighting today, some, like former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, are now sounding the alarm that there is no post-war plan. The main problem, in my mind, is not in the fighting. There we are fighting to the extreme heroic way we can. The problem is that Israel has no vision, no thinking, no planning as to what's then. And despite international pressure to scale back the intensity of the fighting in Gaza, polls here show that Israelis remain overwhelmingly in favor of the war. Hala Garani, thank you. President Joe Biden is expected to sign an $886 billion defense spending bill into law after it overwhelmingly passed the House today with a 310 to 118 vote that mirrored the bipartisan nature of the bill. This legislation includes everything from pay raises for troops to tons of money towards sending weapons to both Ukraine and Israel. But the bill does nothing to advance President Biden's $61 billion Ukraine aid package. That's something Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky was desperate to get approval for during his trip to Washington, D.C. earlier this week. Meanwhile, as his country's fight against Russia drags towards a third year today, during a four-hour press conference, a defiant President Vladimir Putin vowed to fight on. NBC News chief international correspondent Keir Simmons has more from Moscow. Russian President Vladimir Putin uncompromising today at a rare four-hour question-and-answer session, declaring victory in Ukraine will be ours. 
There will be peace when we achieve our goals, he said. While tonight, Ukraine's President Zelensky claiming a victory, a surprise agreement on Ukraine's entry to the European Union. But Zelensky's failure so far to gain billions more in aid during his trip to Washington was noticed in Moscow. These freebies may end someday, and apparently they are ending little by little, Putin said. Though Russia's leader of 23 years did see some dissent on the text messages appearing on screens behind him. You said in 2004, a man may go crazy after seven years in power. This message read, how's your health? Tonight, a veteran lawmaker who says the Ukraine conflict is at a dead end tells us he plans to run against Putin in next year's presidential election. He doesn't think he'll win. After I have said that we should elect other president, not Putin, I was blocked on Russian TV. Russia is on a war footing. An ice rink outside Moscow features a fighter jet and a former Soviet rocket. Millions visiting a Russian expo that includes the history of the Soviet nuclear program. This, a model of Russia's first atom bomb. We are proud of it. It's our history. Uh, we are a great country. Putin also says a deal is possible, though not easy, for detained Americans Paul Whelan and Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich, who the U.S. says are both wrongly accused of espionage. Keir Simmons in Moscow. Thank you. Don't go anywhere because we are just getting started. A jury is deciding how much money former Trump attorney Rudy Giuliani owes to election workers he defamed. Those details are coming up. Plus, some bad weather is on the way for a big chunk of the country. We're talking heavy rain, flooding, and even snow. And morning sickness can be so awful for some expecting moms, they can barely leave the house. But finally, scientists pinpointed the cause, potentially bringing relief to so many. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Just a month ago, a mistrial was declared in the case of former Louisville officer Brett Hankinson. But now federal prosecutors say they will retry him. Hankinson was, is accused of violating the civil rights of Breonna Taylor during a botched raid of her home that led to her death back in 2020. The trial will start in October next year, and he faces a maximum sentence of life in prison. A 13-year-old boy has been arrested after allegedly planning a mass shooting at a synagogue in Ohio. He is accused of sharing plans to shoot members of the synagogue on Discord. That's an online chat platform. The sheriff's office learned of the plot, they say, back in September. And now the suspect will face a full trial starting next week. Cruise, General Motors' self-driving car company, is laying off 900 employees. That's almost a quarter of its workforce. The announcement comes one day after the unit got rid of nine key leaders. Back in October, a pedestrian was dragged 20 feet by a cruise car after being hit by another vehicle. Since then, Cruise has suspended all trips and production. A bill banning gender-affirming care for minors is headed to the Ohio governor's desk. It also bans transgender athletes from participating in female sports. The bill now is in the hands of the governor has who has previously expressed doubts about the sports restrictions. He has not yet said whether or not he plans to sign the bill. We now know the cause of death for actor Andre Brower. He died from lung cancer just a few months after being diagnosed with the disease. Brower was best known for his roles in Homicide, Life on the Streets, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. After a week of powerful testimony from Georgia poll workers detailing the personal toll of Rudy Giuliani's false election claims, a jury is now deciding how much he owes for his defamatory statements. Giuliani initially promised to take the stand and, quote, tell the whole story. Instead, he and his legal team opted for silence. The decision not to appear comes after Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss provided emotional testimony about how his lies damaged their reputations and ultimately upended their lives, they say, to the tune of $24 million each. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian joins me now with more on this. Ken, talk to me about this sort of change of heart, if you will, by Giuliani and his legal team. We did hear Giuliani just a couple of days doubling down and saying he stood by his initial defamatory comments. He got sort of scolded by the judge for doing that. Why did they opt to sit it out? Was this a strategic move, a legal calculation, or just avoiding these women after it was so emotional hearing them on the stand? 
Look, we don't know. They're not saying Ellison, but I think it was, in fact, a strategic move because when Rudy Giuliani went out and essentially defamed these women again in talking to reporters after the first day of the trial, his lawyer had to go in and essentially apologize because his lawyer, in opening statements, took the opposite tack because, after all, the judge has already ruled that Rudy Giuliani defamed these women. And so the lawyer was almost saying, look, I can't control my client. I don't know what he was saying, but obviously that's not our position. And so to put him on the stand would have been a huge risk, and his lawyer must have convinced him that ultimately it wasn't in his interest. Um, it, it's a perplexing situation and really one of the latest in a string of setbacks, personal, financial, legal, for Mr. Giuliani. So what about the penalty in this case? I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. Do you expect the jury to actually award that $24 million that has been asked of them? Does Rudy Giuliani even have the money to pay that? Uh, the answer to that question is no. It, it's likely that he does not. He's in some financial straits right now. One of his lawyers is suing him for a million dollars in unpaid legal fees. There's been reports that he put his apartment in New York on the market. He's trying to sell it for about six million dollars. So it's unlikely that he can pay a double-digit millions uh, judgment. And it, it's really, you know, you never know what juries are going to do in these cases. But this was about as strong a case as I have ever seen for damages suffered from defamation. These women told harrowing stories of horrific racist harassment that was directed their way. Their lives were turned upside down. If anybody deserves millions of dollars for defamation, these women do. And they had a, an expert witness who came in and explained to the jury exactly why. And by the way, they're going to award compensatory damages. That's the $24 million each that they're asking for. And then there's a wild card of punitive damage, which, which is designed to punish Mr. Giuliani. And that could be four times as high as the compensatory damages, wow. Ellison. So can in terms of a timeline, do we know how long the jury will deliberate? I mean, have attorneys or anyone given, it's a guessing game, right, but given any yeah. sense as to how quickly they think there could be some sort of verdict or ruling? Most people watching this trial were actually surprised that they went home tonight without reaching a verdict after three hours of deliber deliberation. I mean, it's not that complicated. There's basically three lines on the verdict form, and, and they have to fill in numbers, essentially. So it would be shocking to me if, if they didn't reach a verdict at some point tomorrow, Ellison. All right. Ken Delaney, and thank you. We appreciate it. You bet. Witness testimony continued today in Michigan for six of the 15 people accused of being fake pro-Trump electors during the 2020 election. Among the witnesses was Michigan's former state GOP chair, Laura Cox, who facilitated the signing of a document and ceremony for those fake electors. I had my document, which I felt comfortable with through negotiation with folks to have a ceremony to honor the electors and have one signature that said that they would vote if, in fact, they were called upon based on an overturning of the election. So all 15 defendants here are facing felony charges accused of submitting false certificates, confirming they were legitimate electors. Each defendant has pleaded not guilty. NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster joins us now with more. Hey, Shaq. Hi there, Ellison. Well, it was the second day of testimony in that Michigan courtroom as state prosecutors continued to call witnesses as part of this preliminary examination, essentially a mini trial where they're trying to convince the judge that they have enough evidence to keep this case moving and go on to a full trial. We heard them call up multiple witnesses today, some high prominent Michigan Republicans, as they tried to lay out their case that these electors uh, committed forgery and conspired to commit forgery when and they signed their names allegedly to a document that attempted to give the state's electoral votes to Donald Trump instead of Joe Biden. Joe Biden, of course, won the state by more than 150,000 votes. Today, we heard from the former chair of the state Republican Party, who testified about how some of these ideas started to pop up, including one idea to have these alternate electors sleep in the Capitol, uh, in the Michigan state Capitol overnight to present that slate of electors. That ultimately didn't happen, but as we heard through testimony from the former communications director of the Michigan Republican Party, we learned that the group instead met in the basement and removed uh, their cell phones from that room, and he testified about what he saw from some of the interactions between this group of fake electors and the Trump attorneys. I think a lot of folks listen to lawyers. 
Um, I think it's a position of authority. And I think that uh, they were being told something by a lawyer to, that they needed to sign certain documents to so that Michigan would not be disenfranchised. And that moment happening during the cross-examination as the defense tried to lay out their defense in this case, essentially saying that their clients were essentially working on a contingency plan, that there was no intent to defraud and that they were just participating in legal objections to concerns that they had about the elections. Well, we can expect to hear these arguments play out in the weeks and months to come. The preliminary examination will continue to go on. It went on for two days. They ran out of time, essentially. So we can expect to see these sets of defendants back in court in February as the prosecution continues to call more witnesses as they try to make their case for this to move on to a full trial. Ellison. Shaq Brewster, thank you. Another big weekend storm is heading to the east, bringing rain and snow to the entire eastern seaboard. Florida is bracing for the brunt of it. They are expected to get slammed with heavy winds and rain. Some areas there will see up to six inches of rain, so they're already pulling out the sandbags. Then the storm, it will head up the east coast, making its way towards New England. The biggest concern is going to be flash flooding risks as the rain continues into the weekend. NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens is here to tell us more about the storm. Good evening, Bill. Well, good evening to you, Allison. And this storm is going to be one huge inconvenience. There are some issues that we could have in localized area. I'm a little concerned with the high tide flooding in Charleston, possibly Myrtle Beach, and also Wilmington. That would be Sunday evening. We'll have to watch that, the coastal areas closely. We always could get some downpours uh, in urban areas, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, poor drainage. We could get some isolated flash flooding. But besides that, the travel issues, the delays at the airports, driving in this, you know, cancellations of holiday plans, holiday parties. That's the kind of things people are going to be talking about. So right now it doesn't look like much. I mean, this is pretty quiet, actually. We have the storm that is going to, the root of the storm is now over Colorado, heading into Kansas. And then you notice all of the clouds to the south here. These two are going to combine. And when they do that, that's when we're going to get our big storm forming. So right now, just kind of gusty winds coming out of the northeast. Been like this for the last couple of days, on and off periods of rain, Miami to Fort Lauderdale. Haven't had any reports of flooding, but it's not exactly pleasant to be walking on the beach either. 41 mile per hour wind gusts. I mean, that's a, you know, low end tropical storm type gust out there. And then as we go throughout Friday, hit and miss showers, same as it was today. The most consistent will be down in the Keys. Then as we take the storm system northwards, watch what happens as we go throughout the day Saturday. It just explodes. I mean, we are going to see very heavy rain going northwards, especially the southern half of the state. Saturday night is when the northern half of the state gets into it. And then then by Sunday morning, everything blows out pretty quickly. So by Sunday afternoon, we'll dry it out. It'll still be windy and gusty and cool, but at least it'll stop pouring. And as far as the totals go, you know, the rainfall totals have actually come down a little bit. Now most areas are about one to two inches. A few spots could be three isolated, maybe four or five, and that's probably the worst of it. So what happens from there? Let's take you to 1 p.m. Sunday. The storm will be right over the top of, say, Savannah heading up towards uh, Charleston. That's where we could have some problems with the gusty winds, and if it coincides with high tide, we could have some some you know, minor to moderate coastal flooding in these areas. Notice the rain shield, though. D.C. gets into it. New York starts getting some rain Sunday afternoon. Light rain through the Ohio Valley. So soggy just about everywhere on the East Coast. But the heavy downpours will be in the Carolinas as we go throughout Sunday afternoon, Virginia Sunday night. And then during the overnight hours into Monday morning, this huge rain shield moves northward. Again, it's fast moving. It's not going to be with you for a long period of time. But 7 a.m. is ugly around New York City and Hartford, heading anywhere in northern Jersey and through the Hudson Valley. Then by by the time we get to Monday, late in the day, the storm is heading the northern New England. Some cold air on the backside gives us some showers. So what does it all mean? As far as flooding potential goes, we'll have to watch closely, especially the, uh, you know, when we get the rain and the coastal storm uh, surge at the same time here, especially in areas around Charleston. And then everyone gets about one to two inches. Not as much as the last storm. That's why I don't think there's going to be a lot of significant rainfall flooding. And Allison, any of those people you know, wishing for a white Christmas or at least to see some snowflakes in our snowless winter, you have to be in the high elevations of the Appalachians, definitely West Virginia, and you will see some snow uh, from Cleveland to Erie to Buffalo to Syracuse as we go throughout Monday, but nothing that's going to cause any problems. All right, we will take it. Bill Karens, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Coming up, a pair of gold sneakers made for filmmaker Spike Lee were found in a donation pile at a homeless shelter. Now they are up for auction, and we have the details. But first, you've got to see this. Holy 
cow. If you're missing a cow, it might be in Newark on the train tracks because somehow one got loose and ended up there. This is Newark's Penn Station. The bull escaped sometime this morning, causing all sorts of delays for commuters while crews tried to corral him. He was first seen around Newark Airport before he moved get it, moved to Penn Station, and then back to the airport where officials finally caught him. No injuries were reported, but what we don't know right now is where this bull came from or where he was headed. Welcome back. Here are some of the stories happening out west that we're following. The L.A. Dodgers introduced their new superstar, Shohei Otani, today. Otani spoke at a news conference just a few hours ago. The Dodgers announced last week that he agreed to that record-breaking 10-year, $700 million contract. And fans, they are pretty excited. Merchandise sales skyrocketed over the last few days. In Oregon, a pair of gold Nike sneakers dropped off at a homeless shelter are now going up for auction. Turns out the golden kicks are super rare and are one of the few custom made for director Spike Lee. The shelter could end up making a ton of money. As for what they're worth, estimates put it between fifteen dollars and $20,000. All the proceeds would go to the Portland Rescue Mission. Lee actually wore a pair of those shoes at the 2019 Academy Awards where he ended up winning an Oscar. And Wyoming could become the first state in the country to ban abortion pills. A decision District Judge Melissa Owens was expected to make as early as today. In previous decisions, Owens has shown sympathy for arguments that abortion bans violate women's rights under the state constitution, though any decision by the judge is likely to be appealed to the Wyoming Supreme Court. Authorities around the country are cracking down on organized retail theft this holiday season. The surge in crime has ballooned into a multi-billion dollar issue, leading major retailers to shut down some of their stores. NBC News senior national correspondent Miguel Almaguer was granted rare access to the L.A. Sheriff's Department, shadowing an elite team engaged in undercover surveillance operations. The shopping centers across the country. He's outside, he's outside, he's outside. Undercover surveillance teams like these say this is the multi billion dollar problem exploding out of control. We've done probably already six or seven this week. We're stepping up our efforts over the holiday season. Got him. Given rare exclusive access to covert operations, we followed the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department Retail Theft Task Force and the California Highway Patrol. Let them come out, we'll get them. So that's a suspect, Puma bag, it's two Puma bags. As officers swarm suspected shoplifters, who they say often work with a network of criminals like this in what's known as organized retail crime. We see these really shocking videos that come out from all across the country. Why is this crime so pervasive? I think there's an absolute perception that nothing's going to be done because it's theft. For years now, we've been looking at mobs of usually it's younger kids, and they believe that if they do it in packs, it's harder to detain and arrest. The thieves, who all too often get away, can swipe tens of thousands of dollars of merchandise taking their hauls to stash houses like this one. The CHP says this makeshift storefront holds over half a million dollars in stolen goods. As officers raided this home, we watched as bag after bag of merchandise was recovered. We've seen boxes of shoes, uh, stolen goods, the price tags are still on them. There's going to be some critics who say this is a dog and pony show. Not enough arrests are being made. Uh, it's a challenge, uh, and I, I think when the theft occurs, uh, we'd like to think we respond uh, as quickly as we can, and we're investigating all of them. We are doing uh, the best that we can. While not every city is seeing a surge in retail crime, some of the biggest are. With Los Angeles, the nation's epicenter, major metropolitan areas coast to coast are seeing a dangerous spike. And authorities say current laws aren't working. If the value is under $950, it's considered a misdemeanor. If they don't have any outstanding cases or outstanding warrants, they will be cited, more than likely released. In just the last few hours with undercover teams, what's become apparent and quite astonishing is just how rampant shoplifting is. You pick the store, it's getting hit over and over again. 
The cost of these thefts, which include everyday items, are eventually passed on to consumers who pay higher prices for the same products. But for small shop owners like Mona Zargar, this heist nearly put her out of business. I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be in this store anymore. How do you replace something like this overnight? The fight against organized retail crime and the rising price we all pay. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News. Republicans insist they won't approve additional funding for Ukraine unless the Biden administration takes action to address security issues at the U.S. southern border. But border officials say the policy proposals being discussed could threaten to overwhelm the system. Tonight, we're taking a look at how one remote town is grappling with thousands of daily migrant crossings. NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley reports from the new Arizona hotspot. Tonight, this is the new epicenter of the border crisis, tiny Lukeville, Arizona, where the number of migrants is pushing Border Patrol past capacity. More than 9,000 illegal crossings along the southern border just yesterday, nearly 3,000 of them in this area. Behind me, there's a group of about 40 migrants, including young children, that were just brought in by Border Patrol after they called 911 because they were stranded in the desert. Border agents so backed up, they're taking migrants to Tucson, where they're processed and most are released into the U.S. The Lukeville International Crossing now closed for 11 days due to overwhelming demand on border agents from migrants. Business owners say they're paying a price. Last week, we had made 5000 which is what we usually would make within an eight-hour shift. We find places along the border wall where smugglers cut holes for migrants. Yesterday, cutting through 16 times. They mark the dates here where they fix the breaches, and you can see this one was just fixed recently. U.S. and Mexican officials tell NBC News one reason for the rise, Mexico's Border Patrol equivalent is running low on funds and stopping fewer migrants. But Republicans blame President Biden's border policies for encouraging migrants to come and are demanding changes before they'll pass more funding for Ukraine. This tonight from the Border Patrol Union. What we need to see from this administration is that they're serious about border security, because when you're allowing so many individuals to come across the border, that preoccupies a lot of agents. President Biden calls GOP proposals extreme. Migrants tell us they're desperate. We are tired. I had to carry my daughter so we could keep going, said Jacqueline from Ecuador. And this man said, we knew this was going to be hard. We do it for our families. Now Arizona's governor is asking President Biden to reassign National Guard so they can open that border crossing to traffic. Julia Ainsley in Lukeville, Arizona. Thank you. This week, the Senate Committee on Health passed bipartisan legislation that gets more people life-saving access to methadone. It's a notable step in the fight against the national opioid epidemic. More than a million people in the United States have died from a drug overdose in the last 25 years. There were at least 100,000 in 2021 alone. And according to the CDC, the majority of those overdose deaths involved in opioid. One camp in New York is working to help children impacted by it, navigating the deaths of people who died from opioids. We visited that camp recently. Take a look. It feels good to look at a picture. Yeah. But he was only 33. Have you lost anybody? <laughs> at its best, camp is a place to be a kid. To laugh and play, to make lifelong memories. Comfort Zone Camp is a place for all of that, but it's also a sacred place to grieve. It's a free bereavement camp for children who have experienced the death of a close loved one. And this is the first session solely for children impacted by the opioid epidemic. Same age. <laughs> it's high energy with lots of chaotic fun. Older camp buddies, games. Oh my, Joey. Arts and crafts. And in between all of it, healing circles. Campers are broken into groups based on their ages and together they work with counselors. Well, what do the pins mean? Oh, the pin means, um, Grief. We met Kaylee in between healing circles. And how old are you? Um, eight. eight. Turning nine. My Abigail, too. They welcomed us to camp life. Yours looks like a braid. 
It's probably not working, I think. No, it is. It is? is. Okay. And started to share their stories. How is the healing circle stuff? Is oh, that... it's good. I almost cried in healing circle. What did you talk about? I was um, saying about my stepdad. Yeah. I'll show you a picture of him. Yeah. Well, you said his name's Ryan? Yes. I would love to see a photo. That's him. Yeah. That's my mom. <gasps> And then that was my younger sister when she was like a baby. Oh. Now she's one. Wow. And annoying. <laughs> As the opioid crisis expands, more and more adults bravely share their stories. But with kids, it can be complicated. The youngest voices don't always have the platform to speak. But here, if they choose, they do. Do you know what I think is really cool, Kaylee? I like how you asked me if I lost anybody. Can I ask you how you found out about what happened to Ryan? Um, me and Mom found him at the same time. Yeah. And then what did you guys do? Um, we, Mom told me to get her phone. Yeah. How did you stay calm to help get the phone and stuff? No, um, I wasn't calm. Yeah. I was like, what is going on? Yeah. They get to be all that they are, to openly process the painful moments seared into their memories. Oh, when I was at my stepdad's friend, I didn't want to set put in that funeral place because I thought he was still going to be what they look like when they're, when the blood's not flowing. Yeah, like purple and blue. Yeah. They don't have to hide pieces of their life. They can cry and they can remember the happy times. And then I'll paint your nails when you're done. <gasps> Yeah, I'll paint. You guys can paint my nails whenever you want. <laughs> Brian, was he a pretty good dad? He was funny, too. Yeah? What do you think he would say if he could see you at camp and doing all this stuff now and helping your mom? He would be proud of me. Yeah. I think so, too. They get to hold space in a community that truly understands them. And all of it leads up to an evening of remembrance. In a moment, you're going to put your notes in the fire. And we're going to listen to words of a song. It was written by campers, just like you. Losing someone to open us. Grief is a lifelong journey. But having a safe place to start that walk makes all the difference. When we come back, there's a renewed call to regulate AI, and it's not from tech leaders, it's not from politicians either. This time, it's actually from the Pope. Yes, the pontiff himself. We will explain why. Stay right there, we'll be right back. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. The leaders of Guyana and Venezuela met on the island of St. Vincent today to try and figure out a way to defuse growing tensions ever since Venezuela decided to claim some of Guyana's oil-rich territory. Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, is happy, he says, for the meeting, saying that it was a way to directly address the territorial controversy. Guyana's president, Irfan Ali, on the other hand, does not seem all that interested in talking, insisting that the whole thing needs to be resolved solely only by the International Court of Justice in the Netherlands. Both countries have just released a joint statement now saying they will not use force to solve this dispute. Pope Francis says he wants AI to be regulated. He made that statement today, calling for a binding global treaty on artificial intelligence. The Pope said that while he was worried about the pitfalls of IA in human hands, he seemed to also be encouraged by its ability to offer new and creative approaches to a host of things. Perhaps like that time his picture went viral wearing an AI-generated puffer coat. 
Hard to say. England's Premier League, which is the top tier soccer league in the country, is getting its first female referee. Her name is Rebecca Welsh. She says she initially supplemented her officiating with her job in the National Health Service before turning to refereeing full time. She will make her debut on December 23rd in Fulham's home game against Burnley. And a recently elected lawmaker in Thailand has been sentenced to six years in prison for defaming the monarchy. The charges, which were handed down this week, stem from a pair of posts she allegedly made in 2020 on the social media platform formerly known as Twitter. One post criticized the Thai government's response to the pandemic. The other was a retweet with a picture the court deemed to be anti-monarchy. She was sentenced to three years on each account. Before we go morning sickness, it can be incredibly debilitating for some expecting moms, but scientists have finally figured out what's causing severe cases of it. We'll have more on the massive breakthrough. Stay tuned. Tonight in the future of everything, what comedian Amy Schumer was just talking about in that clip is a condition that could develop from severe morning sickness during a pregnancy. She dealt with it just a couple of years ago, and now researchers may have found the key to preventing it. A new study published in the journal Nature found that when there's a surge of the hormone GDF-15, it leads to all that nausea and vomiting that is so common in morning sickness. And worst case scenario, it could lead to a condition called hyperemesis. That's what Amy Schumer was talking about, and it can cause life-threatening symptoms, even hospitalization. According to the National Institutes of Health, nausea and vomiting impact 70 to 80 percent of pregnant women. This discovery could pave the way to developing treatment to prevent morning sickness before pregnancy even happens. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal joins me now. So, Dr. Sile, this is amazing, and when I read about this the other day, I was just floored and impressed and thinking, what a world where maybe that could be eliminated. And then I also saw a quote from one of the researchers who worked on it who said, I've been trying to figure this out for 20 years, and I thought, why on earth would it take so long? I think there's a thing a lot of women see and feel where they look at medical research and they say there is still such a big research gap when it comes to conditions that primarily impact women. Is that why it took so long? It's, it's in part why it took so long, absolutely. Ellis and I, I found some crazy facts actually that, that surprised even me. And you know, in, in the, since 2007, there've been less than 10 studies actually funded for hyperemesis, this, this intractable nausea yeah. and vomiting, um, it, about $2 million. And that compares to the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars are spent on things like cancer. Um, so you can see there's obviously a big gap here, but Ellison, I, I know it's taken a long time, but you know, in reading that the when this, this paper was published, reading the comments online and, and just reading the reaction people had, so many people resonated with this. So many people are you know sharing their stories, talking about how you know they were dismissed. They thought this was all in their head, um, and now it's really cool that the, the researcher, who I believe actually suffered from a little mm -hmm. bit of this herself, yeah. um, can say you know we found a reason for this, and, and guys, we might be able to fix it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a lot to look forward to, despite it taking so long. Yeah. So what could treatment look like? And the question. I feel like we always ask you on anything related to medicine and there's never a clear answer because there's obviously steps and layers but it's like how soon could we possibly get access to it. Right. So, so what they believe is going on, Ellison, there's a hormone called GDF-15, or growth and differentiation factor 15, uh, that may be driving this. And essentially that hormone surges in pregnancy, and they think that high levels of that hormone may be causing this. And so if you have high levels of hormone, you can actually block the hormone, hopefully. That's one of the cures. Um, so what they're look, going to be looking at next to study is, can we lower this hormone? Uh, but Ellison, there's, there's another component here. And just because you have high levels of hormone, your body actually has to be able to respond to that hormone. So there's some people. Um, who may have high levels and, and may not have this. And there's some people who have less high levels but may have really bad nausea and vomiting. Mm -hmm. So they have to figure out why is the body reacting so strongly to that hormone. But um, the good news is we do have a biological reason for what might be going on. Very quickly, for people who are watching and are thinking, I've been morning sick, but is it severe, severe? How do you know if you have that more severe condition? Great, great question. So there's, there's morning sickness and there's hyperemesis gravidarum, which is a more severe form mm -hmm. of that morning sickness. So when you're talking about hyperemesis, what are you looking for? Um, really, really severe nausea and vomiting. No matter what you're trying, dietary changes, it's not helping. Um, weight loss, you can lose as much as 5 to 20 pounds, Allison, on this. Um, dehydration and feeling dizzy or lightheaded to the point where you just can't even do anything anymore. When those symptoms become so severe, you may actually be hospitalized. You may actually need IV fluids and additional treatment uh, to get those symptoms under control. But people are not crazy if they're experiencing this. There is something happening, and they should talk to their doctors. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Akshay Sayal, <laughs> thank you so much. We appreciate it, as always. Anytime.
So if you haven't gotten your Christmas tree yet, it's not too late. One farm where you can cut down your own tree is actually taking that tradition up a notch. NBC Now Daily anchors Kate Snow and Zinclay SMWA discovered a tree farm in Easton, Connecticut with a tradition of tailgating. In the Connecticut countryside, there's holiday spirit by the acre. Families come from all over to Maple Row Christmas Tree Farm in search of the perfect pine. But in addition to the farm's fun sights and sounds, there's another holiday tradition that makes Maple Row a little more memorable. A Christmas tree farm tailgate right in the parking lot. Hey, it's tailgate time! Hey, tailgate time. <laughs> Zinkley and I had to try it out, of course. Oh, it smells good. We brought cocoa, cookies, cheese, and company. Cheers, yeah. cheers. My husband Chris and our dog Bowie joined us, yeah. along with Zinkley's friends Kaylin and James. Our best efforts, no match for families like this one. Wow, thank you. Who've been carrying on the tailgating tradition for seven years. What are you making? Meatball. Meatball. What? what? <laughs> and we thought our cookies were fancy. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Meatball parm, barbecue, and even elaborate cocktails. Cheers. Some families staying out here all day long to celebrate tradition. You don't have to come and stay all day, but you do for some reason. Why is that? What's special about it? Well, because it's important to make time together with your family, especially around the holidays. We've done it since we were little. Mm. So now we're starting, hopefully, to pass it on to our kids. Okay. All right. You ready? Yeah. Let's go for a hayride. Once our bellies were full, a ticket to ride. <laughs> the task at hand, find a tree. Oh, they're so pretty. You're getting a little tree. A New York size tree. <laughs> and I'm New getting I'm getting the big yeah. suburban size tree. I love it. They've been growing trees here at Maple Row Farm since the 1920s. On a good day, they'll sell several thousand trees. And of all the people who buy Christmas trees, around 30% do it this way, chopping it down themselves. This is the part where we grab yes, the saw. saw. Oh, right. fun. All right. Uh, oh, I see a tall one over there. Oh, that one's really nice. That was really nice. I like it. Once we found a tree for Kate. Well done. It was my turn to cut down my first real Christmas tree. I gotta go to the gym. Oh, oh you did it! <laughs> you did Yay! it! Yay! So cool. I will do that again. Maple Row, a family business spanning eight generations, often balancing an uncertain economy with the fact that these trees take almost 10 years to grow. I mean, we've raised our prices a little bit each year. Um, these past couple of years have been more than normal. I hope we can keep it going. There aren't a lot of other farms like us around, so hopefully we'll have enough uniqueness and, and it'll work. People are tailgating now at the Christmas tree farm. You know what? It's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a fun holiday. It's just an addition to the tradition, you know? In addition to the tradition, we can certainly get behind. This was so fun. Yes, a Christmas memory made. Cheers. Cheers. Kate Snow and Zinclay SMWA, thank you both. That does it for us tonight. I'm Ellison Barber. We will see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.